Today we'll be discussing Buttonville updates to their established procedures, general established procedures, the NAV Canada warnings tab, established traffic patterns, as well as small minor deficiencies in the NAV drone application. Now before I begin, CARD 901.73 has been around since January 9th of 2019. Thus, airport operators or heliport operators can take a more prescriptive approach when it comes to training standards or testing for access and coordination within their zone. So CARS 901.73 states, no pilot shall operate a remotely pilot aircraft system under this division if the aircraft is within three nautical miles from the center of an airport or within one nautical mile from the center of a heliport unless the operation is conducted in accordance with the established procedure with respect to the use of remotely pilot aircraft systems applicable to that airport or heliport. So in plain English, flying your drone is prohibited in controlled airspace unless it is conducted in accordance with airports or heliports rules. So you want to ensure that you have proper coordination with the heliport or airport. If this coordination or established procedures have not been developed between you or the operator, your flight may be deemed unsafe. Now some operators, they already have developed their own procedures, thus a simple document request for the procedures can be made. Now looking at CARS 901.47, no pilot shall operate a remotely piloted aircraft at or near an aerodrome that is listed in the Canadian Flight Supplement or the Water Aerodrome Supplement in a manner that could interfere with an aircraft operating in the established traffic pattern. So in plain English, do not fly if you know you will interfere with another aircraft in its circuit or pattern. Now let's take a look at a standard established traffic pattern at an airport or aerodrome. So as you can see, there are a variety of legs in this pattern. There is the takeoff leg, there is the crosswind leg, the downwind leg, the base leg, and the final approach leg. Now as a drone operator, you must establish that you'll be safe and secure from all of these legs. In addition, you should ensure that your drone has adequate approach separation from all aircraft operating in the established traffic pattern. Now, looking at this circuit, we can see on the left-hand side there is no apparent circuit. That's what we call the dead side. The active side of this circuit is the live side. General standard circuits are left-hand patterns. As you can see from this aircraft taking off, it will be turning a left-hand pattern to join the circuit. The opposite or right side is called the dead side of the circuit. To further specify, Aircraft can also have right-hand patterns, but this would be provided in the procedure section of the Canadian Flight Supplement. If there is a misunderstanding on how circuits work, think of this as a NASCAR racetrack, where the vehicle is making a left-hand turn at appropriate set distances and altitudes at 500-foot intervals from the track or field. Thus, on the crosswind leg, you should be established at 500 feet, on the downwind leg, you should be established at 1,000 feet. On the base to final leg, you should be descending to 500 feet. On the final leg, you'll be established at 500 feet. Let's take a look at factoring in NAV drone approvals and the established traffic pattern. So as you can see, this request has been auto approved, but depending on your location towards the field or aerodrome, you may require further notification to the aerodrome operator or management. In addition to this, there may be further warnings prior to auto approval of your request. When further looking at the NAV drone grid squares in the NAV drone portal, it may be a good idea to take a look at the authorized upper and lower limits of that grid square to plan your flight accordingly. Now, if you do not plan the flight accordingly, and go above the authorized limit, you will need human intervention in which the flight will not be auto-approved. In addition to this, there may be some instances where additional warnings may be had before your flight can be approved. When planning your flight, it is a good idea to take a look at the whole entire picture, factoring in NAV drone approvals, as well as DJI Geozones for the appropriate 
traditional aircraft approach corridors so you can map your flight accordingly, staying away critical approach phases of aircraft when they land or take off. In this example, the DJI Geo zones were used in corresponding with the aircraft, the Autel Evo 2. This example shows that there is a horizontal separation from the DJI restricted zones. Again, the DJI Geo zones are just being used to highlight the appropriate separation from the appropriate horizontal separation distances from aircraft approaches. In utilizing the nav drone grid squares as well as lattice approach corridors, this will offer an effective and safe manner of flying near an approach corridor. From there, it is an additional suggestion to use the National Research Council drone site selection tool to measure distances from launch areas, from the center of the airport, also from the edge of a runway from your particular launch site. Having these measurements will also aid in your safety of launch, takeoff, the cruise phase, and landing. In addition to this, factoring in the established traffic patterns as per CARS 901.47, this can be factored in the, uh, the procedure section in the Canadian Flight Supplement. By graphically adding an airport or aerodrome's established procedure on a map, this will allow you to understand safety areas and approach areas near the aerodrome that you should avoid, as well as setting up or choosing specific altitudes for safety. As you can see in this particular mission, it states the altitude would be 49 feet or 50 meters, well below the upper grid square limit, uh, offering roughly a 450 foot clearance uh, for takeoff landing of the RPAS. Furthermore, factoring in the NRC site selection tool via the grid square limits as well as your offsets will offer you a good understanding of measurements from runways as well as your prescribed horizontal max distances utilizing DJI Geozones slash Lattice. For noted horizontal separation distances from aircraft on approach and drones. Utilizing both the nav drone grid squares as well as DJI Geo Zone slash lattices approach corridors is something that our school uses as a safety approach for mapping drone flights near aerodromes and or airports. Now, this is not a set transport cannon procedure, but I would say it helps in understanding the established traffic pattern when factoring in the procedure section from the Canadian Flight Supplement for safety of flying of drones. Now there's a question asked, is this good enough? The answer is no. You just facilitate understanding the CARS requirements of 901.47. You still have to facilitate 901.73, the established procedures from the aerodrome. So let's go through a few checklist items. In going through our airport slash heliport checklist, one of the first things that you should do before you fly is a site survey. Now, what we just prepared a while ago was CARS 901.47, the established traffic pattern. Conducting a site survey should also factor in your established traffic pattern of that airport. So conducting your site survey, 901.27, is very important when flying near an airport or heliport or aerodrome. Second is you want to contact the aerodrome operator to find out their established procedures. Now, this may also be an additional training course. I will show you an example later on of an aerodrome enacting an additional training course. Lastly, once you gather all the information submitting this documentation to NavDrone for the local representative at the nearest flight service station to handle your request. Now, some of you may ask, how can established procedures or traffic patterns affect your operation? Now, according to Nav Canada's website, there are 42 staff towers in Canada, which roughly means there are 42 Class C or D airports in which airport operations or management control. Now, when we factor in the 126 Class E airports or 370 heliports, there is a potential of 168 airports established procedures and factored in again 370 heliport established procedures. Now our past procedures are not yet documented like manned aviation procedures in the Canadian Flight Supplement. I would assume eventually NAV drone would want to put this information in there similar to how 
traditional manned aviation aircraft have documented procedures for aerodromes or airports that are located in the Canadian Flight Supplement. When interpreting the latest copy of the TCAIM, page 456, October 2022 edition, it states, Please note that aerodrome, water aerodrome, airport, and heliport operators don't have access to NAVDRONE RPA flight authorization information. If you choose to operate your RPA in one of these areas and see traditional aircraft operating, it is recommended to land the RPA and reassess the situation. If you notice regular aircraft activities at a location, it is recommended to contact the airport operator to better understand the local traffic circuit procedures and to coordinate your RPA operations. So according to 901.73, you must understand the established procedures in respect to that aerodrome or airport. And it states to further go on, although aerodrome operators can prohibit someone from using their premises, they cannot forbid someone from using the airspace residing therein. From a statement from Transport Canada, they state, technically speaking, as long as you can adhere to the cars, you would have access to the required airspace. However, the agreement with the airport authority may have limitations or conditions consistent with safety from their end that need to be met to ensure their operations are conducted safely. NAV Canada may also have a role to play depending on your operation and its location. Will prescriptive updates be made to the TCAIM? That's something that we'll have to wait and see on. When looking at the generic approval process, NAV Canada and airport operators work hand in hand to establish safety procedures that affect their aerodromes or airports. Thus, it is always important to conduct your research before you fly. So let's take a look at some standard NAV Canada warnings that you may see in NAVDROME. The first is, your requested operation is within a distance of one nautical mile from the center of a heliport. Conduct the operation in accordance with the established procedure with respect to the use of the RPAS applicable to the heliport. The second is, your requested operation is within a distance of three nautical miles from the center of an airport. Conduct the operation in accordance with the established procedure with respect to the use of the RPAS applicable to the airport. Now you're wondering, what should you do? Well, if you're flying near a hospital or heliport, contact and or advise hospital security of your flight. If you're flying near a generic heliport, contact heliport management. If you're flying near an airport, contact airport management. Contact information can generally be found on the OPR section of the CFS. Now let's say you decide to do without following the established procedures. There are fines. Transport Canada, the Civil Aviation Division, publishes its corporate and non-corporate offenders list to both serve as a deterrent and to increase public awareness and education concerning aviation safety. So let's see a few of these fines. From searching the non-corporate archives of 901.73 to date from January 9th of 2019, there has only been one fine levied for 901.73 violations. But this does not mean Transport Canada is not actively enforcing this. Make sure you follow the regulations. In addition to this, fines to date on 901.47, non-corporate fines, there have been three non-corporate fines for fines against not following the established traffic pattern. That's 901.47, non-corporate fines for not following the established traffic pattern. In looking at standard fines levied for non-corporate fines, it appears the set fine fraction amount is generally $250 for non-corporate fines and $2,499 for corporate fines. As explained earlier, some aerodromes may require additional training to access the airspace. So the, here's an example of additional training requirements at Toronto Buttonville Airport. So as it states, training is available through approved providers only and training is only available as an online computer-based training module. Each module must be successfully completed and pass with a pass score of 80%. Training includes the following topics, 901.62, 901.02, 901.27, 901.28, 901.29, 901.30, 901.31, 901.32, 901.33, 901.34, 901.36, 901.37, 901.39, 901.40, 901.41, 901.42, 901.43, 901.44, 901.45, 901.46, 901.47, 901.48, 901.49, 901.51, 901.52, 901.53, 901.54, 901.55, 901.56, 901.57, 901.58, 901.59, 901.60, 901.61, 901.62, 901.63, 901.64, 901.65, 901.66, 901.67, 901.68, 901.69, 901.70, 901.71, 901.72, 901.73, 901.74, 901.75, 901.76, 901.77, 901.78, 901.79, 901.80, 901.81, 901.82, 901.83, 901.84, 901.85, 901.86, 901.87, 901.88, 901.89, 901.90, 901.91, 901.92, 901.93, 901.94, 901.95, 901.96, 901.97, 901.98, 901.99, 901.10, 901.11, 901.12, 901.13, 901.14, 901.15, 901.16, 901.17, 901.18, 901.19, 901.20, 901.21, 901.22, 901.23, 901.24, 901.25, 901.26, 901.27, 901.28, 901.29, 901.30, 901.31, 901.32, 901.33, 901.34, 901.35, 901.36, 901.37, 901.38, 901.39, 901.40, 901.41, 901.42, 901.43, 901.44, 901.45, 901.46, 901.47, 901.48, 901.49, 901.50, 901.51, 901.52, 901.53, 901.54, 901.55, 901.56, 901.57, 901.58, 901.59, 901.60, 901.61, 901.62, 901.63, 901.64, 901.65, 901.66, 901.67, 901.68, 901.69, 901.70, 901.71, 901.72, 901.73, 901.74, 901.75, 901.76, 901.77, 901.78, 901.79, 901.80, 901.81, 901.82, 901.83, 901.84, 901.85, 901.86, 901.87, 901.88, 901.89, 901.90, 901.91, 901.92, 901.93, 901.94, 901.95, 901.96, 901.97, 901.98, 901.99, 901.10, 901.11, 901.12, 901.13, 901.14, 901.15, 901.16, 901.17, 901.18, 901.19, 901.20, 901.21, 901.22, 901.23, 901.24, 901.25, 901.26, 901.27, 901.28, 901.29, 901.30, 901.31, 901.32, 901.33, 901.34, 901.35, 901.36, 901.37, 901.38, 901.39, 901.40, 901.41, 901.42, 901.43, 901.44, 901.45, 901.46, 901.47, 901.48, 901.49, 901.50, 901.51, 901.52, 901.53, 901.54, 901.55, 901.56, 901.57, 901.58, 901.59, 901.60, 901.61, 901.62, 901.63, 901.64, 901.65, 901.66, 901.67, 
get approvals, and don't break the law. So, on our final topic of today, we're going to talk about some nav drone deficiencies that may help drone pilots. The first is aerodrome and airport management cannot see drone activity. The second is no grid square APIs for drone manufacturers such as DJI, Autel, or Skydeal. Third is broadcasting drone locations specific to ADIS for manned aviation safety. How can this be rectified? Provide aerodrome and airport management drone data from nav drone. Basically an interface where they can interact with drone traffic within their area or aerodrome. The second is provide grid square geofencing APIs to all manufacturers for free in the essence of public safety. Now what is an API? In short, it's a plugin that allows two separate program interfaces to talk with one another. This would be great for drone manufacturers in essence to build the relationship further with NavDrone and allowing other drone operators to access airspace information and having the drone manufacturer also access air information to ensure safety of all air operators in the air. Having grid square upper and lower safety limits will not only help with air safety but will also prevent potential crashes or collisions in the air. So to reiterate, having again grid square safety limits hard baked in with APIs or plugins to manufacturers will further assist with public safety. Thank you again for watching. Sugu, a safer future with technology.